What's up guys, Rogue9 here. The test server for Operation Ember Rise is out and I've spent the past few days testing and analysing a whole bunch of changes. So in today's video I want to take you through all of my results and look at all of the gameplay focused changes. Let's go! Starting off with some of the balancing changes, we have an update to the shotgun destruction coming with the new season. Up until now, the way shotgun breaching has worked is that, as long as you are 8 meters or closer to the wall, each pellet will create an immediate impulse in that wall. If you are further away, each pellet will create a bullet sized hole instead and of course, if you are 40 meters or more away, the pellets just evaporate because that's the max range of shotguns in Siege. In addition to the damage to soft walls, the wooden studs within each wall were also destroyed if they were hit by one of the pellets when fired from 25 meters or closer to the wall. Now the problem with this system was that, because of the random spread of the pellets, it was possible that you would shoot out a soft wall but that the studs could remain in your way because the pellets had just all managed to miss them. The new destruction system coming with Ember Eyes will include a feature that when a shotgun pellet hits a wall and creates an impulse, that strike also has an area of effect around it that will delete any stud that is close enough. This makes it impossible to shoot out a wall and still have studs remain. If for whatever reason the wall has already been shot out by a regular gun, then you will still need your pellets to hit the studs or at least a piece of the remaining wall directly. And since we're on the topic of destruction, Maestro and Alibi's Keratos 357 and the French operator's LFP586 revolver will from now on have the same destruction capabilities as the D50. What does this mean? Well, as you may know, there are essentially two different types of soft walls in Rainbow Six Siege. Plasterboard, also known as drywall, and wood. Almost all of the guns in Siege will need 6 shots to land close together to create an impulse in drywall and 10 shots for wood. When bullets pass through the first layer of wall they lose half of their destructive potency so when you shoot 6 bullets into drywall you will need 3 more on the other side to open up an impulse there and for wood it's 5 more shots. The D50 has always been more powerful than this though and the Keratos and LFP will now be buffed to be the same. Two shots will open up one side of drywall with one extra shot opening up the other side and four shots plus two more for the other side will be enough for wooden walls. Studs of course will still be an obstacle that cannot be taken out with these pistols but at least you can open up quick and easy sight lines and given how powerful both the LFP and the Keratos are I think it makes perfect sense for them to be upgraded to the level of the D50 despite the fact that 357 Magnum ammo is still significantly smaller in caliber than the 50 Action Express. One one small issue I see though is that it makes the Bailiff 410 shotgun revolver even less useful. As a weapon, the Keratos was always my go-to pick when playing Maestro or Alibi and now I can even use it to rework the map to a certain degree. The only advantage that the Bailiff now has is that it can take out the studs and allow you to open up soft walls fully, but because it's only a 410 pistol it still is probably the worst shotgun in the game for opening up walls. So yeah, Keratos all the way for me from now on and I will either bring impact grenades or let one of my teammates deal with reworking the site instead. Next up is a significant nerf to the shield operators Blitz, Montagna and Fuse. According to the patch notes, their aim down sight time from behind their shield is being increased by 50% from 400 milliseconds to 600 milliseconds. And when I tested and compared the current live and test server builds, that's pretty much what I found. Aiming in on the live build takes 400 milliseconds, although there is a small blip at 600 milliseconds where your operator moves the gun just ever so slightly in order to settle the shield. And conversely, the new ADS time on the TS is definitely 600 milliseconds, confirmed. Here's the funny thing though. Back during Operation Wind Bastion, I did a full test and review of all of the ADS times in Rainbow Six Siege and back then I measured the shield ADS time as 600 milliseconds. Sadly, I don't have any footage from those tests left since it's pretty much 9 months ago, but I still remember testing every single pistol in combination with the shields and being very meticulous about getting the shield ADS time right. So there was either a little buff somewhere along the line or I really managed to mismeasure the ADS time by 50% back then. Uh, yeah, no, there's no way that I got it wrong by 200 milliseconds. No way. 
Look, I'm only human and I do make mistakes sometimes, but because I double and triple check everything, I very rarely let anything slip through and no way did I somehow measure shield ADS time wrong by 200 milliseconds for every single pistol that shield ops can use. But the past is the past and what is important is that compared to what is live right now, the shield ops are definitely getting nerfed. The new and reworked deployable defender shield that has been on the test servers for quite a while now is being added into the game and if you don't know how it works yet, it's pretty simple. We get little bulletproof glass slits that help anchoring defenders see their opponents without having to expose themselves and there is now an option to attach the shield to doorways when deploying. The deployment option is a nice little feature but boy oh boy, those little bulletproof slits make the gadget so much stronger. You basically have a mini alternative to mirror available to a whole bunch of defenders now and because the new shield is going to be so strong there are going to be a minor shed load of secondary gadget changes in the game. Smoke is getting a deployable shield and losing his impacts and I think that this makes perfect sense for his role. Many players choose to run the shotgun slash SMG 11 combo anyway so impact grenades are pretty redundant on him and the shield can really help him stay safe until the final push and he can even deploy his gas canisters from behind the relative safety of the shield now. I like this change, it makes complete sense. Frost is also getting the shield and losing her barbed wire for it. This change is less helpful in my eyes. Frost isn't really an anchor. Her gadget is completely fire and forget and once all of the mats are down, she's free to roam. Not only is having a shield in that scenario a complete waste, but the barbed wire always comboed quite well with her mats if you were trying to hide them. Neither the shield nor the bulletproof camera are all that useful I feel. Warden is the third operator who will be getting the new shield at the expense of his impacts and here again I see the sense in this change. He's a 3 armor and his gadget is all about resisting the push of attackers so giving him a shield to anchor behind makes sense. But because the change to the shield is a substantial buff we are also seeing a bunch of defenders lose access to it. Rook and Mira are getting barbed wire. Jaeger and Legion are getting a bulletproof camera and Maestro is getting impact grenades. As I mentioned earlier, the fact that both Maestro and Mira have impacts makes the Bailiff pretty much redundant after the destruction buff of the Keratos, but I'm not against impacts on Maestro. Being able to quickly rework the site is a good thing for him. Rook and Mira also make complete sense as anchors and even though I never see myself using the camera on Jaeger or Legion, I guess it's not bad to have. The main purpose of all of these last few changes anyway is to remove the powerful shield from these ops and that is a move I can definitely get behind. What they get added back in return is almost secondary. Having more powerful shields on the defense, including of course Goyo's Vulcan shields, means that it is also more important for the attackers to be able to counter them. And what better secondary gadget to have than hand grenades, which I believe is exactly why Dokkabi is losing her stuns and Glaz his claymore and they are both getting hand grenades instead. Nurk is the final operator to see a secondary gadget switch and she is losing her stuns and getting a claymore instead and of course the reason for this is... Yeah, I got nothing. If you have a theory as to what this change is supposed to achieve, leave it in the comment section below, I would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so that's the secondary gadget changes done and dusted, let's maybe move on to one of my favourite topics in Rainbow Six Siege, weapon balancing. All the way back when Jackal was introduced into the game during Operation Velvet Shell, I tested his guns and discovered that the PDW-9 actually has a minor reverse damage drop off. Since way back then and all the way up until now, the PDW always did 34 damage up close and 35 damage after drop off. I've reported on this several times and I think I may have even sent in a support ticket right at the beginning. By this stage I was simply assuming that it was going to stay in the game because it actually made sense from a balancing perspective or something. But no, the gun is finally getting proper drop off stats and it is even getting buffed at close range. The new damage will be 38 up to 18 meters and then dropping off to a measly 26 damage from 28 meters and onwards. What does this mean in terms of the capability of taking down your opponents? At close range you will need one less shot to kill against level 2 armors and level 3 armors wearing rook plates when you hit them in the legs only. And because of the fire rate of 800 RPM, that one less bullet will save you 75 milliseconds to down or kill your opponent. 
not too shabby. At long range though, the nerf cuts deep, and you're going to need either one or two extra shots against all armor type and shot location permutations, and of course, that extra shot will mean 75 milliseconds extra time to kill. This now makes the PDW-9 a close range specialist where the TTK against level 1 and 2 armor defenders up to 18 meters is actually better than the average of the assault rifle class. It's only against level 3 armors or at range where the PDW-9 struggles. But like I mention in almost every one of my videos, Siege is an incredibly short ranged game and all in all, I think that this change is a buff to the PDW. I will now have to redo the Jackal loadout meta to see how the new PDW faces off against the C7E, but we'll keep that for a future video. Kaed's Org A3 is also getting another buff. The gun was horrifically balanced when it launched and at the time it was probably the worst SMG you could pick. But over time we've seen a number of fixes and buffs and with the next season we are getting just that extra little bit of damage out of it, finally. Short range damage is getting buffed from 33 to 36 points and the long range damage is going from 24 to 26 points. At short range that will make Kaed predominantly more effective against level 1 armors but theoretically also against level 2 armors with body shots if for some reason they manage to pick up rook plates. Due to the lackluster fire rate of 700 RPM, each bullet you save means 86 milliseconds less to down or kill. At 28 meters or more, the buff is even more effective, saving you one shot to down or kill and the corresponding 86 milliseconds in most situations. This buff means that the A3 actually has a slightly above average damage output at close range compared to the rest of the SMG class, and at long range it is just 3 damage per second below the average. Overall, I appreciate this buff and I think that it will bring the Org A3 more in line with the other SMGs in the game, although it will still remain a little underpowered by comparison. Again, I may revisit Kaed's primaries with an updated loadout meta video to re-evaluate the choice you will have with him. And because I'm currently so efficient, look out for that video coming to the channel in the next few months or so. Apart from these two major changes to weapon balancing, there are also a handful of smaller changes. The 417 designated marksman rifle is getting a magazine upgrade from 10 to 20 bullets. This is nice and all, but the reason that the 417 is hardly ever seen in game is because Twitch has the F2, still one of the best rifles in the game, and even Lion's V308 is a very decent gun to have. For me personally, 10 extra shots per mag is not going to make me use the 417 any more often, but it's nice to have, I guess. The Vector 45 will get access to the extended barrel. As you may know, I'm not a huge fan of this attachment in general, but I have been meaning to go back and retest it for a while. Off of the top of my head, I would say that on a fast firing and more challenging to control gun like the Vector, giving up on the compensator or muzzle brake for a little more damage at a distance that you won't want to be fighting at anyway is not the play, but more investigations will follow. The Supernova primary shotgun will get a suppressor now and while stalking around with a silent shotgun might make you feel like that badass assassin guy from No Country for Old Men, the lower damage makes it even weaker in combat than it would normally already be. I think that most players will agree that primary shotguns on attack are rarely the best play and now you can make this one even weaker if you want. Enjoy! And finally, the G8A1 is now getting the option of attaching the angled grip. The key weakness of all of the LMGs is of course their slow ADS time, and with the angled grip the G8's time comes down from 550 to 330 milliseconds. That is a very worthwhile improvement, and while it's still a little longer than the 300 milliseconds of most defender primaries, it is nevertheless very good compared to most attacker weapons that need 450 milliseconds. The G8 stays relatively controllable even without the vertical grip, so my preliminary judgement would be that the angled grip is looking like a great choice on this gun. I would say give it a go when you get the chance. The next topic is all about gadget buffs. Fuse's cluster charge deploy time is going down from 2 seconds to 1.6 seconds. Fuse is arguably most vulnerable during the deployment of his gadget and cutting this time window down by 20% is a nice little buff that should make him a little more viable without the risk of making him completely OP. Like that one time ages ago when the area of effect of his cluster charges was buffed and it allowed him to clear half the map of defenders with each charge. Fun times if you liked playing as Fuse, not so 
fun for many, many hostages. Warden's spy glasses are getting buffed as well, similar to the recent mid-season buff we saw to Glass. The duration of Warden's special vision is increased by 25% from 8 to 10 seconds, and in addition to that, the movement penalty is much lower now. As you can see in the side-by-side -side comparison, even the slightest movement up until now would completely destroy the smoke-piercing effect of the glasses, but now there is a much more relaxed tolerance. I understand that when Warden was launched, there was a worry that he would be just as annoying as Glass, and the movement penalty was kept very strict as a consequence. But time has shown that Warden is too situational, maybe a bit too boring, and underwhelming, so these changes here should definitely be a step in the right direction. Capitao's fireballs are also changing a bit as well, but as you can see, the change is purely cosmetic. The propagation of the area of effect is more subtle now, and we get more of a flame effect, which makes the reach of the flames easier to see. It's not a huge change, but I like the new look. And finally, one gadget change that has been worrying the community quite a lot is the change to Thatcher's EMP grenades, especially in relation to bandit tricking. The patch notes are a little confusing here by saying, we are implementing Thatcher's debuff icon when defenders are under the effect of Thatcher's EMP grenades and will extend to gadgets that are attempting to be deployed while in the disabled state. Does that mean that we can no longer deploy gadgets while under the effect of Thatcher's EMPs? Well, good news everyone, thankfully the answer is no. As you can see in the background footage, Thatcher's ability will not stop you from placing deployable gadgets such as bandit batteries. Thatcher will have the same effect on operators as before. Electronic sights and laser sights will be disabled and certain operators such as Vigil, Pulse and Clash will not be able to use their primary gadgets while the debuff is running. Nothing is changing except now the defenders will get a timer on screen that shows them exactly how long the debuff will last for. A change that is coming in for all operators is that the distance at which they can vault onto or over hip-high objects is being restricted to 2 meters down from 2.5 meters. I tested and compared this in game and have to say that the change feels almost unnoticeable. And I guess that makes sense, half a meter is not a lot and it shouldn't really make much of a difference to you in game. Finally, we're going to see the trend of boosting getting addressed with a new matchmaking restriction for the ranked mode that will block a party from queuing up together if there are players in the squad with an MMR score more than 1000 points below the highest squad member. So if you're one of those people who runs a second account all the way down to copper each season so that you can squad up with your friends and cheat the matchmaking system, then sucks to be you because that won't work anymore. I personally appreciate this step because it will solve the problem, but I do believe that there are better solutions. What if the matchmaking algorithm was tweaked in such a way that anyone with more than a thousand MMR below the highest ranked squad member simply gets discounted when calculating the team average? So with a squad of two copper fours and three plat ones, the average team rank simply becomes the sum of the MMR of the three top players divided by three, and the two other players just don't even factor in at all. That way, you can also no longer cheat the matchmaking system, but friends at different ranks can still play together. I appreciate that this might be a bit more technically challenging, especially because the matchmaking algorithm is a third-party product from Microsoft, but unless there are any legal restrictions with the licensing, I think it's worth making the effort to implement this solution at some point in future. And last but not least, many players on the test server have been reporting an unannounced buff to the secondary SMG recoil in the game. I tested the recoil patterns of all the machine pistols on both the live build and the test server and found no real difference. In parallel, Prodigio Pete was also conducting these tests and in his video, link in the card above, he explains that it is the visual recoil of the gun model that has changed, probably due to the rework of the first person animations in this patch. This makes this weapon class much more comfortable to use even though the recoil itself is still the same. Since Pete's video came out, the TS patch notes were updated to say that the devs are looking into the recoil for machine pistols and I've been able to confirm with them that the reduction in visual recoil was not intended. What happens now is up to them. This accidental buff might be deemed acceptable and it might be left in the game for when Operation Ember Rise is fully released, or it might get fixed in the coming weeks before launch. What are your thoughts on this accidental buff? Fix it or leave it in? Vote in the poll shown in the top right hand corner of your screen now.
I also ran a couple of side by side comparisons to see how noticeable the change in first person animations is and I'll let that run in the background for a bit now. Personally I've not been offended by the new animations but I've seen some people comment online that they definitely feel the difference and it bugs them. I guess at the end of the day it's all down to personal opinion really and all I can say for myself is meh. If it helps streamline the game it's no worry to me. And there we have it, all of the most important gameplay changes coming with the new season. There are of course a few new style announcements that were also in the published patch notes, like the new champion's rank, unranked match type, etc etc, and if you want some insight into those details, you can check out the patch notes in the season section of the official Rainbow Six website, or of course you can listen to the next episode of the Hot Breach podcast, available on all good podcasting apps, because we will be discussing all of the news in full detail then. Until then, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next episode.